And we are back yet again on the Thick Manning Podcast to give you our Week 9 predictions for the 2022 NFL season. And starting things off, we are going to look at a Thursday night game, which reminds me of many other Thursday night games. It is going to be boring, uninteresting, and have very little for the casual fan to enjoy, which will see the Philadelphia Eagles traveling down to Houston to take on the Texans. I'm a big fan of Davis Mills. Davis Mills is a tank general. He's the best quarterback in his class, and he's a very special player in my opinion, but he has nothing around him. Brandon Cooks is underachieved. Lovey hasn't been doing much. The run game has not been as dynamic as many people thought. Maybe they should have cut Marlon Mack. Who knows? The Philadelphia Eagles are the best team in the NFL right now, record-wise. They've got a great defense, great quarterback, great receivers, very solid running back, amazing offensive line. There's really no comparison there. The Eagles are going to walk all over the Texans. They're going to remain undefeated, and Philly's fans are going to remain obnoxious. I mean, there's no need to, for us to even spend time on Thursday night football games at this point. We are doing Amazon a service by even promoting their games because we know how many, they know how many viewers we have. The Texans are taking on the Eagles. The Texans are a one-win team. The Eagles are undefeated. They did trade for Robert Quinn. They got even better during the trade deadline. And the only team the Texans have even beat this season is the Jacksonville Jaguars in which they only scored 13 points. When you're playing one of the three best teams in the NFL, by far the best team in the NFC, you do not stand a chance. The Texans are going to lose. If the Eagles find a way to lose this one, I will be shocked. I will say that the Eagles fans are feeling a little bit confident eight weeks, nine weeks into the season. You guys haven't beat a good team yet. And don't call me though, the Vikings are 6-1. and one. The Vikings aren't a good team. You do not have any impressive wins and you will get smoked by one of the top dogs in the AFC if it comes down to it. But moving on to the actual games, and thankfully we do not have a London matchup this week. Instead, we have Los Angeles Chargers traveling over to the ATL to take on the Falcons. And while this game should be fairly entertaining because the Falcons are much better than most people expect, I expect the Chargers to pull this one out. They've got better receivers. They've got a better quarterback, less mobile. Their running game is more developed in a lot of areas. And while their defense has suffered a few injuries, I still think it's better than Atlanta's. So I'm going to give this one of the Chargers. It's going to be a very good game, a great game to kick off the day. But ultimately, LA will prevail over Atlanta. Second game into the video, and you are already wrong. And I can't imagine the heartache that Chargers fans are going through right now. Going into the season, they looked like one of the best teams in the NFL, and injuries have simply decimated their roster. Right when Keenan back gets healthy last week, Mike Williams is out for four weeks. Now, Keenan Allen is still struggling with that hamstring injury. I believe I saw that he suffered a setback. Then Josh Palmer, who is their second, third or fourth receiver on the depth chart, is struggling with an injury. Donald Parham is still struggling with an injury. Joey Bose is not back yet. Their offensive line is still really bad because they lost Rashawn Slater a couple weeks ago. The Char- Chargers have lost everything, and to, to those fans out there that uh, criticize, oh, the Chargers are hyped up every year. Your team, if you lost Rashawn Slater, your best two wide receivers, and your best defensive player would also be struggling significantly. So I, I don't like that criticism of the Chargers. It is all due to injuries why they're not good. And the Falcons on the other side are becoming a good football team, despite what us and many others thought coming into the season. They are putting everything together. They are winning games, and it doesn't even really seem to matter the quality of the opponent. They have quality wins over the 49ers and Seahawks, have losses to bad teams, and have losses to good teams. It doesn't seem to matter who their opponent is. They stay in games and wind up losing or wind up winning. So heading into this matchup, I think the Falcons are going to win this game, because last week they also got Kyle Pitts involved in the offense, and he's finally coming around the season. I think the Falcons pull up an upset against the Chargers if it's really even upset at this point. Okay, what we're not about to do is sit here and pretend that the 49ers are a good, impressive victory. That team sticks. That team has no offensive identity. That team couldn't score on a hooker. Now, granted, I will give you the Seahawks have been much better than most people have That team is average, though. They can't really score that many points. They don't win gunfights, and their defense isn't too good. Like, they've got wins over average teams at best and lose to the real teams. I know the Chargers are depleted, but I just have a little bit of faith in Justin Herbert. Based off the hype he had going into the season, based off what we've seen so far, I just have this smidge of faith. I cannot imagine him losing to the Dirty Birds. I mean, we have faith. I, we both have faith in Justin Herbert, but at a certain point with the injuries that offense has suffered, it is extremely difficult to win football games. They don't have much left, and their offensive line is slowly becoming one of the worst in the NFL again because they lost Rashawn Slater. It is not up to snuff what we thought it was going to be heading into the season. So with the way the Falcons have been winning games, and the way the Falcons 
Falcons have been playing, I think they come out with the victory. But, you know, we're just going to go in circles at this point with this one. Everyone loves a cyclical argument. An argument which will not be cyclical, though. The Dolphins are about to smash the Chicago Bears. And, you know, Justin Fields, he's been playing all right the past two weeks. Meaningful contributions on the ground. Big fantasy contributor. But at the end of the day, the Dolphins have Tyreek Hill. They got Waller. They got Tua Tungvaloa. They've got Gasecki. They've got an amazing offense, which is going to be able to outscore the Bears. And their defense is just so much better, particularly with the addition of Bradley Chubb and his shiny, shiny $100 million plus dollar contract, which he was just paid out. I expect Chubb to have an amazing first game on the fans. Absolutely smoke Justin Fields a few times, which is a fairly impressive achievement considering how elusive and athletic Fields is. And the Dolphins offense to roll. My name is going to Chicago and giving them that spicy, spicy L. The, the Dolphins had one of the biggest free agent, uh, biggest in-season trade moves when they traded for Bradley Chubb and then inked him to a $23.5 million contract. And while that is vastly overpaying for what he has produced so far up to this point in his career, it does make their defense significantly better because he's a very good edge defender, even if he doesn't put up the sack numbers on the stat sheet. And heading into this game, the Dolphins are more talented everywhere. Tua is 5-1 and one as a starter, has the highest quarterback rating in the NFL. Tyreek's on pace to break Calvin Johnson's single season receiving yards r- record. Jalen Waddle has been very good this season. The Dolphins have found a run game with Mike McDaniels and Raheem Mostert, so the Dolphins are good pretty much everywhere, and they got better on defense. The only way the Bears can win this game, and I think we're starting to see how the Bears can win football games, is if they slow down the game and run the football well. They have the number one rushing offense in the NFL. Because of how talented the Dolphins are, I don't see that really happening, but if that does happen, that is where they can get it done. I'm still picking the Dolphins to win. Not really a controversial take there. The Dolphins are just a better team. Everyone knows this one's one of those free wins we rack up every week. On to a battle of the Cats, which will feature the Cincinnati Beagles hosting the Carolina Panthers. And the Panthers often seem to have caught a little bit of lightning in a bottle with P.J. Walker. Walker is putting up big points, dropped 34 against the Falcons, beat the Buccaneers in a decisive game, and now he's going up against the Bengals, whose defense not that good. They've been slipping. Everyone thought they were going to be this amazing unit going into the year after the playoff run. Now, not so much. So, it could be another high-scoring affair. Particularly, if the Bengals are dealing with the issues they have dealt with offensively all year. Now, sure, they've got some injuries, but at the end of the day, Joe Burrow has put up monster games without his star receivers, and I think it's going to be very easy for him to do that again, consider how bad the Panthers' defense is. It is a terrible, terrible putrid unit. Gave up a 37 to the Falcons. So, it's uh, going to be a fireworks show, a gunfight, if you and at the end of the day, I'm going to pick the XFL legend to win this gunfight. I expect the Panthers to go to Cincinnati and upset the Bengals. I think I've predicted the Panthers to lose almost every single week this season, and it will come as a shock to nobody that the one game I'm predicting them to win is against the Bengals this week. Last week, against the Browns, the Bengals looked completely lost without Jamar Chase in their offense. Joe Burrow didn't seem to really know what to do, and he was sacked five times. The Bengals offense without Jamar Chase is not something something pretty to watch. It is not fun to watch. And whether you want to bl- blame it on Burrow, blame it on the coaching, blame on the offensive line, when they do not have three re- elite receivers to get the ball to, their offense is not something special. And it suddenly becomes one of the worst offenses in the NFL. And Jamar Chase is still out. The Panthers, on the other hand, seem to have found an offensive rhythm without w- with trading away Christian McCaffrey to the 49ers. Dante Foreman is averaging 6.2 yards of carry over his last two games and has somehow given life to the Panthers offense. PJ Walker also is included in that. He's been playing very well after watching Baker Mayfield be the worst quarterback in the NFL over the few weeks he was starting. So I think the Panthers go into this game with momentum from trading away Christian McCaffrey, adding PJ Walker into that offense, and I think they get a victory and Brian Burns winds up sacking Joe Burrow three to five times because that Bengals offensive line without Jamar Chase catching passes, I don't know if he's holding the ball too long. I don't know if Zach Taylor has any other plays, but they cannot get it done. Panthers pull out a win. It will truly be an impressive victory for our friends in Carolina and ruin their tank for Bryce Young. And I just cannot wait to see the Panthers fans celebrate this hollow victory knowing that it will result in them losing a franchise-changing quarterback. Although P.J. Walker may well be that franchise-changing quarterback, but we will see later. On to Detroit. And the Lions are hosting the Green Bay Packers. The Packers team which is falling apart, which is rattled, which is shaking the hinges. Whose fearless leader Aaron Rodgers is more concerned with doing ayahuasca and appearing on Joe Rogan's podcast than actually winning games and developing the young talent around him. So for that reason, I am picking the Detroit Lions. Sure, they're not that good of a team. Their defense, not that great. Their offense, strolled to points in the year, but they're getting back healthy. And I think they'll be able to do just enough, just enough to beat a feeble Packers offense, because that offense is not scoring any points in Green Bay. And I think the boys in Detroit, Jared Goff, Amara St. Brown, Swift, 
will be enough. Just enough, but enough. I'm going to give this one to the Lions in a close victory, low scoring for I'd say like 21 to 20, that sort of game. But Detroit superior offense, superior leadership, superior quarterback play, superior coaching, and superior rookie edge rusher is going to be what decides the game. Now, the popular pick for anyone that isn't a Packers fan is to pick the Lions to win this game because Aaron Rodgers and the Packers have been floundering. And I knew heading into this prediction that Isaiah and his delusional Dan Campbell agenda would pick the Lions to win because some reason this he still thinks- This is a delusional thinks... anti-Aaron Rodgers agenda. This has nothing to do with Dan Campbell. I don't know. You, you have a pretty I strong Dan it's Campbell Aaron agenda. Rogers agenda. And I got a stronger I, Rodgers agenda, trust me. I knew he was going to pick the Lions this week, but at the end of the day, they're just a bad football team. And when it comes to the Packers, I think last week they started to get on a little roll offensively. Aaron Jones went for 143 yards. Romeo Dobbs finally emerged a little bit, giving Aaron Rodgers a receiver to throw to. Their receiver core has been absolutely putrid, giving up little to no giving little to no production but last week unfortunately for them they were playing the best team in the nfl the team with the most firepower in the nfl and the buffalo bills so this week when you were playing the worst defense in the nfl and your offense is starting to get on a roll and you're playing a team that does is not well coached dan campbell has what three wins o over his entire career as a Lions head coach it's going to be an easy victory for the Packers Aaron Rodgers is going to pull it out there is no such thing as an easy victory for the Packers unless they're playing the Chicago Bears this year it's just how it is they are going to get in a scrap if you want to say oh the Lions are going to fail to win by all means I'll say I'll acknowledge that that's a fine take say oh it's going to be a blow easy well that's ridiculous Packers ain't blowing anyone out Lions don't get blown out by anyone but the Patriots and the Cowboys but on to Jacksonville and there's been a lot of controversy surrounding the young Trevor Lawrence. People are calling him a bus, saying, oh, he's got five wins and 20 losses. He's horrible. Fields is better. Mills is better. Yada, 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 yada. And those people are right to a certain extent. Now, Grant is essentially Justin Field, excuse me, Trevor Lawrence's rookie year, given the Urban Meyer situation last season. No development whatsoever, and he has not looked good as a rookie this year. Paired to the fact his offensive line is still one of the worst in the league, I would say even worse than the Bears, as a matter of fact, and it's no surprise that the young quarterback is struggling. Those struggles will continue against the Raiders. The Raiders' offense is better, their receiving core is better, their quarterback's better, their defense is better, and... Frankly, they look better coached so far in the young year. I know the Raiders have been struggling mildly, but I think they're going to really start turning their season around with a week nine win over the Jaguars. They're still going to be able to make that playoff push. If they get in the final wildcard spot, who knows what they're at least going to compete for. And that starts here. Well, it may be possible but that the Jaguars actually regressed, or sorry, Trevor Lawrence, regret, <laughs> Trevor Lawrence regressed under Urban Meyer last season and that he actually didn't have any time to develop and actually took a step backwards. But regardless, both teams, I think, are pretty disappointing from what we expected heading into the season. The Jaguars made a lot of big offseason moves, added Evan Ingram, who was a better tight end than they had. I mean, they were trying to roll out Tim Tebow almost last season. Uh, they added to the wide receiver room with Christian Kirk. Uh, Zay, jo Zay Jones, their other number two Dynamic receiver on their team. Moves, ooh. Uh, on, and then on the Raiders, they've also been very disappointing. It feels sort of like the Chargers where they've suffered key injuries to some of their players on offense, but they just don't have Justin Herbert. Derek Carr is not Justin Herbert. And Josh McDaniels, he doesn't have the best head coaching track record. So into this game, I wouldn't really be shocked at either team that wins, but I think the Raiders are a more talented football team, and I believe in Derek Carr and Devonta Adams to get it done in Jacksonville. Now, do you think Carr is going to be able to completely outperform Lawrence, or do you think both of them are going to struggle a good bit? I, I don't see... Jaguars pass rush, they do get after it. I don't know who's going to look better. I mean, Derek Carr has been disappointing this season, but I, I believe in... Derek Carr's veteran status and that he has had some big games this season and he has the better weapons. So that's just why I want to lean the Raiders and I also like the Raiders more. So I'm kind of hoping they win. Everyone's allowed to have their hopes. And speaking of hopes, the hopes of the Indianapolis Colts have died and been buried. Now, they've got an uncertain quarterback situation. It looks like they're overpaying Matt Ryan. Jonathan Taylor seems to have regressed, and they're forced to face the best coach in football history. A normal, logical person would say, oh, the Patriots are going to win thanks to superior coaching, whatnot. Not me. I believe the agendas around the demise of Jonathan Taylor have been greatly overhyped. Taylor is still a top five running back. He's still 
He's still top three running back for all being honest, and we're going to find that out this week. The Patriots don't have a particularly strong run defense. It's not bad per se, but it's definitely on the lower end of average. You compare it to the Colts, who have a much more powerful run defense, and then you take the quarterbacks out of this game because we don't know who's going to be starting for the Patriots. Because it's going to be Zappy, it's going to be Jones. In the Atlas situation, that's a mess. The passing game is not going to be a factor in this one. So just based purely off the strength of each team's run game, I'm going to give this one to Indianapolis. I think John the Taylor is going to have at bare minimum one. 130 yards and drag the Colts offense much like he was dragging last season to a dump. I mean, you can you can say all you want about the Colts run defense and we can live in the past with Jonathan Taylor's 2021 campaign. But when it comes down to it, Jonathan Taylor has been struggling with that ankle injury this season and the Patriots have also, also have a very good rushing attack. Ramondre Stevenson has dominated this season, is averaging nearly five yards a carry and has become one of the better and more productive running backs in the NFL. I believe in his ability to go out there and fuel the Patriots offense to a victory. Whether it's Zappy Hour out there or Mac Jones, who has been struggling mightily, they're going against Sam Ellinger and Ramondre Stevenson this season has been more productive than Jonathan Taylor. And the Patriots rushing attack has been very, very, very good at points in certain games. So I'm picking the Patriots to win. I think we can agree that this will be a good game for the old heads because there's going to be about 20 total passing attempts between both teams. There is no way they put the ball in Zappy's hands or Ellinger hands right surely not mac jones zappy whoever i mean both teams their their success lies in the run game exactly and speaking of a team whose success lied in the run game until they lost their feature rookie running back the new york jets are hosting the actual team from new york in the buffalo bills which will see them get absolutely humiliated now trading for james robinson was a good move they've still got a functional backfield but at the end of the day functional is not good enough when you're playing the best offense in the nfl the bills have weapons everywhere they look like they've got the best receiver in the league this year with stefan diggs maybe tyree kills in that conversation too and of course they've got the guy who should be the mvp front runner and josh allen this game is going to be a blowout the Jets. G- the Jets defense is just good enough, just good enough to keep the Bills under 40 points, but that's about it, and their offense won't be able to keep up. An easy victory for the true New York team. Well, the Jets, like I said, I said it last week, they lost the juice to their offense in Brees Hall. He is extremely talented and is what made the engine function in the Jets offense. Zach Wilson, I think we're all starting to realize it was comical to consider him a first round pick, let alone the second round pick, because people valued his ability to make plays outside of the pocket at BYU. He hasn't been able to do that at all, and all he does is make ill-advised throws. They'd be better off with Joe Flacco or whoever else they have on their practice squad than Zach Wilson at this point. And when you are playing the Buffalo Bills, who are the best team in the NFL, in my opinion, and the only time the Bills ever really get in a close game is when they're playing one of the three to four other elite teams in the NFL, it is going to be a blowout. The Jets don't really stand a chance, and we're going to see Josh Allen put up 300 passing yards, uh, 70 rushing yards, a rushing touchdown, two passing touch, three passing touchdowns. It's not going to be close. The agenda about Zach Wilson, everyone is pushing, is fairly lazy. He did have 350 some passing yards and two touchdowns last week. Made three a few horrible mistakes. interceptions. Again, a few mistakes, but there is talent there. It's not some, oh, I can't believe this guy didn't get drafted in the sixth round like Tom Brady. He's got less than a talent. It's just not manifesting correctly, which, hey, some of that's on him, some of that's on coming from BYU, and some of that's on B. Being a New York Jet, because when you're a Jet, you're a Jet all the way. <laughs> On to a pinnacle matchup of the week, one of the best games Vikings fans will ever witness in life, because this is the game which will let them know that their charlatan of a quarterback, Kirk Cousins, is a tremendous fraud. He will not be able to perform against his formal team in the Commanders. He's got no shot. I get the Vikings only have one loss to the Eagles. Nobody cares. They are a bad team. At best, they're a mediocre team. <laughs> You pair that with Kirk Cousins' presence in road games. Not that good. Then, against a team who knows him inside and out, the Washington Commanders. Not good. He is not going to be able to get anything going offensively. And with Taylor Heineke behind the wheel for the commies, I think they'll be able to do just enough to score more points than Kirk. The Vikings are going to get exposed and humiliated this week. And I, as a Vikings fan who despises Kirk Cousins, cannot wait to drink the tears of the Minnesota faithful who are not in touch with the route and believe this man will deliver us a Super Bowl. It's never happening with him, and you're going to have to accept it after this week.
Well, you need to you need to slow down on the self hatred a little bit because the Vikings are a good football team. They just may not be a great football team. They have talent all over their offense. Dalvin Cook, a g- excellent backup running back, and Alexander Madison, Justin Jefferson, one of the uh, three best receivers in the NFL. Adam Thielen, very solid number two receiver, although he is a little old at this point. And they just traded for T.J. Hawkinson, who as an athlete and as a talent is capable of being a top five tight end in the NFL. So in the offensive side of the ball, they have all. All the talent in the world and on the defense they are at least average so they're a good team I think you're, you're hating on them too much to call them a bad team and there's, there's a little bit of self-hatred in there now in Washington side of the where team, does the ball come from how does the ball reach all that talent they got Kirk Cousins who's better than Taylor Heineke mm. I don't know. Taylor Heineke dueled Tom Brady in a playoff game fairly recently. I don't think Kirk Cousins is man enough to do that. Now, now Taylor Heineke is better than Carson Wentz or Carson Entz, whatever you want to call him. And that was still a horrible trade for the for Washington. But Washington's organization is going through turmoil. They're getting sold every single week. Their head coach, their coaching staff is making comments about certain players that are kind of like, what are you doing? Support your players, specifically Carson Wentz and their quarterback play in general. Either way, I, this is an easy win for the Vikings. The Vikings have only lost to the Eagles. They're a good team. You need to stop hating on your own no, team. No, you have not watched a single Vikings game, I don't think. They barely beat the horrible Saints. They struggle against teams who can score any sort of points. They're not a good team. They're an average team at best. They've got a mediocre defense and a bad quarterback throwing to a bunch of really good receivers and running backs. You can't They're name more than good. 10 They're teams They're not that are making better than them. it past. They are not making it past the first round of the playoffs this year. On to a team, though, which is the one to make the first round of the playoffs, which nobody saw coming. The Seattle Seahawks are paying a visit to the Arizona Cardinals. And Tristan and I both believe the Seahawks were done for the year. The Goose was cooked. They were tanking. They were going to use those draft picks from the Broncos, pay for their own to build their future, get a young quarterback, get a young, get a Stroud, and really develop and try and get Pete Care one more ring. Turns out, that window is still not fully closed. This is a playoff team who admittedly struggles on defense, but has a high-powered offense, which is playing together for the purposes of winning as opposed to the purposes of being missed are unlimited and putting up individual stats and is really starting to click. They're facing the Cardinals who have turned their season around since Hawkins came back. They now have an offensive identity. Hawkins is one of the best receivers in the NFL and the six weeks off made him a little bit better rested. I think this is going to be a very good game at the 405 hour. I'm going to slide the uh, advantage over to the Arizona Cardinals. I thought they were going to beat the Vikings last week. Turns out they did. A bit disappointed by that in some ways. But now I'm pretty sure DeAndre Hopkins is going to be able to take advantage of that somewhat lackluster Seattle secondary for at least 150 50 yards, and that'll be enough to get the Cardinals a dub. I'm starting to think that Pete Carroll made a deal with the devil because when Russell Wilson came in, he kind of saved his career. Matt Flynn was going to be his starting quarterback, and now all these years later, it looks like his career is finally going coming to a close. It looks like maybe the Seahawks are going to have to force them out, him out as the head coach after another bad season, and then somehow Russell Wilson is traded to the Broncos. They get a boatload of draft picks. Russell Wilson falls off the cliff, and then Geno Smith comes in and lights the world on fire in the Seahawks offense and shows that maybe it wasn't Russell Wilson all along. So it seems no matter who, when Pete Carroll's on the downslope, when it looks like everything is down, all of a sudden he figures out a way to have things turn around. And the Seahawks defense has been getting better every single week. At the beginning of the season, they were horrible. They were on pace to be a historically bad defense. They've gotten better every week and their offense has talent all over the field. We thought DK Metcalf was going to be out for a long time. He's now back. He's an elite receiver. Tyler Lockett is very good. Uh, uh, Kenneth Walker looks like he's one of the five best running backs in the NFL as a rookie. So I think the Seahawks win this game because the Cardinals are just not all that dynamic and are the worst coach team. Okay, we don't need to start talking about how good the Seahawks defense is. Oh, big deal. The Giants scored 13 points against them. The Giants kind of stink too. They're in the same boat as the Vikings. But I, I get the pick. It's a logical pick. And it's going to be a good game. I think we can both agree on that. Bit of a high scoring affair perhaps. I mean, but- it still should be a good game, but I think the Seahawks, I just, it feels like a game the Seahawks win, given how the Cardinals have been struggling. It's also a home game for the Cardinals, which is a beneficial to Hopkins coming back matters a lot. Anyway, on to a matchup we saw in the NFC playoffs, the divisional round between the Buccaneers and the Rams. And... About eight weeks ago, everyone thought, oh, this is going to be an amazing game. This is one of the big matchups in the regular season, which is probably going to determine the one seed in the NFC. Now both these teams are fighting for a playoff spot. The loser of this game might not make the postseason. The winner of this game might not make the postseason. And ultimately, the Rams offense has been 
probably the worst in the NFL. It's very close, if not the worst. You compare it to the Buccaneers, who are right in that boat with him. But one thing has changed for the Buccaneers. The divorce has been finalized. Tom Brady is a free man. He is not going to see his kids or his wife, anyone in his family. All he has to worry about is football. No more lawyers, no more family, just throwing the pigskin around. So I think that's going to be enough to get the Buccaneers a dub this week. The offense is going to be revitalized with a new single Brady looking to impress all the hot 40-year-old millionaire women in Tampa Bay, and they are going to smoke the reigning Super Bowl champions. Well, something you're not really acknowledging is that the Buccaneers offense seems completely lost. They seem to forget how to put up points, and their defense has also, while it was very good at the beginning, of the season has not been all that great. I mean, they just give up 21 points to the Panthers of all teams who looked like the worst team in the NFL three weeks ago. So the, the Buccaneers are all out of sorts. And on the Rams side of things, their offense is putrid, but their defense has still been good. So I don't really, I think both these teams are bad. I don't think either of them are very good. The, the Buccaneers offense is lost because their offensive line is struggling. And on the Rams offense is lost because their offensive line is struggling. And they don't have much of an offensive identity outside of Cooper Cup. So I think this this game is almost a wash. I don't really know who to predict, but for the sake of just being contrarian, I'm picking the Rams defense to kind of be the reason the Rams pull out the football game, and I think the Rams are going to win. Ah, I love a nice little bit of contrarianism. On to the Sunday night game, where the Kansas City Chiefs take on the Tennessee Titans. And if we were talking about this game, if it was a week five matchup, I'd say, oh, the Chiefs blow them out. Easy affair. Titans have been stringing wins together. They're not pretty wins, but when your offense relies on running the ball, very few wins are pretty in the modern NFL. Derrick Henry is getting back into form. He's starting to remind everyone why he is the best running back in the NFL, why he should have gotten the MVP a few years ago, and why he is the engine behind this offense. I don't care that Daniel's terrible. Tannehill does not concern me in the least bit. In a regular season matchup with Derrick Henry pounding the rock against this Chiefs defense, I'm going to have to give the edge to Tennessee. I'm aware of all the weapons the Chiefs have. Travis Kelsey, best receiving tight end in football. Mahomes, best quarterback in football. They can throw it to a billion different players and each one can probably get open and cut you for 40, 50 yards. But still, I think the Titans get the ball and they control the tempo. They grind it out. They don't let Patrick Mahomes have the ball to throw it around. They keep that clock moving. And if that clock keeps moving, the Titans offense keeps moving and they keep moving up in the win column. I'm going to give this one to the Titans and they fairly big upset. So, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> There's no way the Titans find a way to win this football game. I mean, you take a look at the teams that they've beaten. You're talking about Derrick Henry is finally back. They play the Texans, who have one of the worst rushing defenses in the NFL. I think the worst rushing defense in the NFL. And one of the worst teams in the NFL. They beat the Colts twice, who are a very bad football team, do not have a good offense. And they beat the Commanders, who also don't have a good rushing defense. And what you failed to mention about the Chiefs is you talked about how good their offense is. And the Titans don't really have much of a chance at stopping them, uh, the Chiefs offense, because of how dynamic and high powered it is. But the Chiefs defense is the third best rushing defense in the NFL. It is not like Derrick Henry is going to be against going against these putrid rushing defenses we've seen them go against over the last four or five weeks. That is not happening. And they're having, Mal whether it's Malik Wills or Ryan Tannehill, they have the worst passing attack in the NFL. So they simply do not have the firepower. They don't have the receivers. They don't have the quarterback play. Uh, if Derrick Henry even goes for a 100 yards, that is not enough to beat the Chiefs. The Chiefs are going to win this game in easy fashion. Finally, the impressive victory on the Chiefs' schedule. They beat the Cardinals without DeAndre Hopkins. They beat a Chargers team who was missing half their town. They lost to the Colts. They barely beat a struggling Buccaneers team. They beat a Raiders team who looked dead in the water. They got humiliated to have been a blowout against the Bills. And oh, they beat the 49ers with Jimmy G at quarterback. Congratulations. They did not get Chiefs humiliated. They almost overrated. and should have probably beat they the They were Bills. on the verge of humiliation. Chiefs got lucky in that game. Now, this is the third loss for the Chiefs season. I will never pick a team which lost to the Indianapolis Colts to beat the Tennessee Titans. That's just how it goes. It's a weird, <laughs> cyclical little thing, but... They also would have won that game if Travis Kelsey doesn't drop the touchdown and their kicker's not injured. Like... Shoulda, woulda, coulda. On to Monday night. And we see Lamar Jackson facing off against the New Orleans Saints in the Superdome, the greatest venue in all of football. And Lamar is going to do what Lamar does and shine very bright when the lights are also very bright. He's going to have a phenomenal game, great rushing attack. Gus Edwards is going to get involved in the place of Dobbins, a little bit active on the ground, maybe 100 yards, give or take, few rushing touchdowns, meaningful contributions. The Ravens defense is going to lock up the Saints, and this game is not going to be particularly close. The Saints have been ravaged by injuries, the salary cap, anything which can go wrong has go wrong, and the only possible upside is that Taysom Hill may get some reps at quarterback, which would be very good for one of my fantasy teams, considering he is my starting tight end. 
But this one's an easy Ravens victory. Well, I mean, Gus Edwards is struggling with an injury, so I don't know if he will be playing in this game. But the Ravens, I've said it every single week, when the Ravens offense puts everything together on a drive, their offense is in sto- is impossible to stop. Their offense is elite. It's just that they don't put it together enough. But they are playing the Saints, and the Saints are not a great football team. A lot of that is due to injury and having a first-year head coach. So I think the, Raven, the Ravens are going to pull out this victory. It may be closer than we all expect because the Ravens have a tendency to do that to us. Uh, Lamar Jackson's better than what the Saints got. The Ravens offense is better than what the Saints have, especially due to injuries. So the Ravens win this game on Monday night. That has been our predictions for the ninth week of the NFL season. Let us know what you think down in the comment section below. Tell us what we got wrong after the fact and pretend you knew it all along. And we will see you in the next video.